Good morning. I count it a blessing to be here again. It's, again, always good when you can look at God's Word and He just, this is what you got. There's so much in God's Word. And uh, if you look at the front of your bulletin, it says, and, it, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. Genesis 2 9. Perfect. Very, very fitting for today's sermon. Couldn't be better. Um, I have much to share. Um, yesterday was one of those days where you wake up rested, so to speak. And, and you open God's Word, and He's like, run with it. And uh, you get excited about it. Um, so I'm excited for what God has for me, or for all of us this morning. Not just for, for you guys, but for myself as well. I looked at this, and I was like, wow. Okay, there's much for me to learn as well. Um, so before we get into the sermon, I have a little bit of a something to look at. Something that, that a lot of us look at, we're like, wow, that is, that is really beautiful. Some of us look at it as like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, some of us look at certain parts of this, and we're like, well, I don't want anything to do with that. And we look at the other part. Um, and some of us prefer the other part, the bottom part. Um, but as I was studying this and thinking about I want to share something that we can take with us this morning home, not just spiritually, but physically, if there's enough, um, that we can remember who we are in Christ. So I've also conscripted Abigail. I gave her a heads up this morning. She is our green thumb in the house. She does all of her flower beds. Praise the Lord. And uh, so I want her to come up, and I want her to look at these objects in here Obviously, said green thumb, so you know a little bit what's coming. But um, some differences, some similarities, some things that are missing, and uh, and then we'll get into the sermon topic. So, Abby, come front, please. So, these are things that people look at and they go. Those are beautiful, especially when guys. <clears throat> but what is, you can pick them up, you can look at them. What is different about these roses? There's no thorns on these roses. No thorns. Are they all the same? We got one dried up rose. Um, what are things that choke roses out? Um, weeds and aphids. But uh, they need clean ground. They need growth. Do you like roses? Mm -hmm. I won't say anymore. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, if, if you look at a rose, most of them have what on them? Have you alluded to it? Most of them have what? Thorns. These, I picked them up yesterday, that's the first thing I noticed. If you go to grab a rose, usually you're going to get an ouch because they hurt. The, the prickles on them, they jab your fingers. These, they strip the thorns off. Thorn-free roses. I thought that's amazing. What do we look at? Do we look at this part? Or do we look at normally the thorns and everything else? Just think about that for a second. In like half hour, 40 minutes. Um, but I'm thinking about this time of year, most of the time, those that have green thumbs are spent outside, trimming, getting the flower beds ready for the winter and cleaning up the leaves and, and everything else. Um, I was taken back to a time where when I lived at home, even 10 years ago, 
um, there was a very active man out in the flower beds. It wasn't me. It was my dad. And roses were his specialty. He loved rose bushes. To this day, there's still rose bushes in the front flower beds. And I was down Wednesday night, I had to do some electrical work for my mom, and, and uh, one light pole fell down, falling down in the uh, hurricane. I had to do some wiring. But out front, tall rose bushes. They were still pruned. My mom was keeping after some of them. And beautiful flowers on them. And you look at the, the rose bush itself, and you do not go and pick up the stem. It will hurt. These rose bushes had lots and lots of prickles on them. When my dad worked on them, he usually had gloves. So, um, so yes, this time of year we, we trim the bushes, the perennial plants, pull out the unwanted debris and the weeds, and get the flower beds ready for winter. Fall is the perfect time for most plants to be trimmed or pruned. Keep that pruned in mind this morning. One flower that has been in my family for many years, it was my dad's favorite, is the rose bush. I remember my dad going out most evenings and Saturdays he wasn't working to work in the flower beds. Now say work, he enjoyed it. So if you enjoy something, it's not really work. But he enjoyed tending the rose bushes. <clears throat> to pull the weeds, to pull dead parts of the rose bushes off, to check for aphids and other bugs that would destroy the rose bushes. I remember the many times he would put on gloves when he was working on them. He would always, he always had them on his workbench with his gloves and all his tools needed to work in the flower beds. I remember if he didn't wear the gloves that he would get stuck often by the prickles on those rose bushes. I also remember him coming in the house with blood on his hands because of the rose bushes and the prickles on them. <clears throat> but he loved doing, he loved what he was doing. He loved each and every year to plan ahead, to look at the new variety of roses that were, they were coming out with, the different colors, the shapes, the sizes, and most of the time as a family, we would dread the coming year because that meant that the flower beds were going to be bigger, which meant that there would be more pruning and more weeding and more time spent taking care of everything else. That's how we looked at it. I also remember holding his hand there in the hospital room before he passed away and remembered the time that he spent caring for those roses. It's actually one of the things I remember. And the effort that he put in to make sure those roses bloomed each and every year. And thinking, he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to care about a plant. He didn't have to put in the effort to do anything for those things. But holding his hand there, I remember, you know what? He cared. <clears throat> God cares for each one of us as well. So when we look at the things around us, when we look at each one of us here this morning, how do we view ourselves? There are over 300 species of roses and tens of thousands of cultivars, which are breed one rose with another rose and get this color, which I, I didn't know that, I didn't know you could do that. I know you could do that trees, but roses, I didn't know you could do that. Um, but there are many, many varieties of roses. Um, the facts about some roses that we know of, and this is just a few that I pulled up they are beautiful flowers. I personally, I love rose bushes. Why? Because my dad did. And he instilled me, instilled in me, you know, if you take care of something, it will bloom. It takes time, it takes effort, but it will bloom. They smell good. I know for a fact, these smell good. Picked them up yesterday. Yep. Smell like roses. Smell delicious. They are shown out of love and appreciation. One of the oldest flowers known, to, they are one of the oldest flowers known to man. Another fact I did not know is the rose is the U.S. national flower. We know about the bird, we know about a lot of other things, but the rose is the U.S. national flower. 
In 2006, David Austin, after 15 years of rose cultivars, trying to breed two rose bushes, sold the Juliet Rose for a whopping $15.8 million. For rose. It was had that much value to him. Somebody else. I think the number was he spent five million making it. <clears throat> a rose plant depends on someone else, though, to prune and take care of it properly. So a rose plant depends on someone else, though, to prune and take care of it, to properly grow so it doesn't get choked out by weeds. God's design of nature and all of our surroundings is absolutely amazing. It is good because God made it himself. So two questions I want to I want to start with here this morning. First question is to make it personal. How do I see myself? When I look at myself, how I see my failures, my flaws, my personality, and my attitude towards others. How do I view myself? Don't think about anybody else. Think about yourself. This is the only time I want you to be selfish a little bit. Think about yourself. And the next question, how does God see me? My failures, my flaws, my personality, my attitude towards others. So how I look at myself and how God looks at myself are two totally different things. Two totally different ways. So when I look at a rose, do I see the beauty in them? Or do, you, do I see from the rose petals down and I see everything else? I see the weeds, I, th I see everything being choked out, the life being pulled out of it. What do I see? So paint that picture here for us this morning. Matthew 11 verse 28, 30 says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest upon your, unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we have that right there. Do we believe it? Do I believe that the yokes, the, the burdens that I carry, that, that I can just give them to God? You can turn with me to Mark 5, the sermon text here this morning. And if I did not share the sermon title, it is A Rose Amongst the Thorns. That is the sermon title, A Rose Amongst the Thorns. Um, <clears throat> so I think you know where we're headed here this morning already. <clears throat> so Mark 5, Jesus is healing, he's going about, and he is, he's got throngs of people around him. Um, and when I say throngs, I mean it's not just hundreds, it's probably thousands. People are seeing what Jesus is doing, and they come to him for what? For healing. Um, so in this passage of scripture, we got three people that have been touched. It starts with one man. One man, we mentioned in Sunday school here this morning about being vulnerable. It took one man to be vulnerable, and the chain of events that happened after that are quite amazing. Mark, Mark 5, starting at verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she, li and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of, of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but, grew, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in and pressed behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straight, straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press, and said, Who touched my clothes? And the disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude 
thronging me and saith, Who touches me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. And the woman seeing and the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be, and be whole of thy plague. So we have Jairus. He is one of the leaders in the synagogue. And he sees what Jesus is doing. He hears the good news. He sees the miracles that Jesus is doing. <clears throat> to the parable, it's not a really parable, it's a true story. And today's lesson starts with Jairus and the fact that he, was a, that he has a young, sick daughter. Now, as a father, I would do anything for one of my children. We see one of our children sick, what do we do? Take them to the doctor, we natural remedies, whatever we can to, to see them not in pain. So this, this father sees this, his, his daughter sick. I'm sure he's exhausted everything he could have done already. And says, you know what? I got one more option. That's how, that's how we look at it sometimes. I got one more option. I got my last choice. But where does he turn? turns to Jesus. Actually, that kind of goes against the thought process of the leaders of the synagogue at that time. Um, but Jairus had a heart of love for his daughter, and it shows that God's plans are perfect. It, whatever led up to that, it was a plan by God. So, in this first couple of verses here, Jairus meeting up with God, or meeting up with Jesus, and he said, hey, daughter's sick. Could you come and heal her? And without hesitation, Jesus and everybody else, everybody else is still following Jesus. They're going to Jairus' house to see his daughter. Now, I put myself in Jairus' shoes, how that would make me feel. Yes, my daughter's going to be healed. No more sickness. No more pain. We can get back to life as normal. Whatever that is. <clears throat> so God's plans are perfect. They are right. And everything always works out according to his plan. So Jairus, stepping out in faith, calls on Jesus to come and heal his daughter. As Jesus is going along the way, this woman that has a blood disease for about 12 years. I did that times 365 because when we have an illness, when we have an ailment, when we have a struggle, it's the here and now. It's like, when is this going to stop? We have a bad cold or bad cough, and we're, our chest hurts, and we're just constantly in pain, constantly coughing. When is this going to end? We want relief right away. 4,380 days. That sounds a lot longer than 12 years. We put it in days instead of years, but it makes us Try to put herself in her shoes. She had a physical ailment for that long and just wanted relief. <clears throat> so as this woman, doesn't say her name, but says a certain woman, as she reaches out and touches Jesus' cloak, instantly Jesus, is, Jesus knew that someone had touched him. And you think all the people around him, all the people following Jesus, I'm sure there wasn't crowd control. They didn't have it roped off. It's not like you see the Pope and his motorcade. Everything's roped off. Give him space. This was Jesus. Everybody wanted to be near him. Everyone wanted to be close to him. And he knows as soon as this woman touched his cloak. He knew a part of him had left According to his plan, according to God's will. So I looked up the meaning of virtue. Because when, when we look at virtue, we, we think of something that's virtuous, something that is right, something that is perfect. And there was many Hebrew meanings. Um, I think it's five or six, depending on um, what it's used for. Um, but I want to read some of these. It says, degree, 
merit, purity, cleanness, brightness, chastity, morality, treasure, quality, peculiarity, merit, integrity, honesty, righteousness, equity, probity, which means the quality of having strong moral principles, honesty and decency, courage, strength, and stoutness. I can say without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is each and every one of those. And this woman just wants relief. She reaches out and she touches his cloak. And instantly she's healed. Why? Because in her, she had faith that Jesus was going to heal her. If she didn't have faith, why would she even go and try to touch his cloak? She saw the miracles that Jesus was doing. She saw people getting up and walking. She saw the blind being able to see. And we look at ourselves. Look at, look at myself and look at yourselves. And we look at all of our thorns. All of our issues we have in life. There's no way I could ever get rid of that thorn. There's no way I could ever get rid of that pride. There's no way I could ever get rid of that whatever it is. That's what the thorns represent. Our, our struggles in life that are, that are normal. Doesn't mean we, we give up and we be content in those, but that we continually strive and strive to get closer to Jesus Christ. So as we continue to strive and we have that personal relationship and He comes alongside of us and He builds value. He sees us for who we are. 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15, it says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. So I want to clarify something here, though. I, I, we need to cry out to God. In our time of need, at any time, have our communication with God. Um, but this does not mean that if we want something and pray about it, God will give it to us. That does not mean that. God wants that communication. He wants us to talk to Him. But this woman and Jairus, in their hearts, were at the end of the road. They didn't know where to turn to. They didn't know what else to do. So, again, make it personal. I can think of my life, and I can think of when I didn't have any more rope to hang on to, and I can see the end of the rope somewhere down the road right there. And what value is it in us when we see the end of the rope? How we view that? Or do we, do we view it as how God views us? In our time of desperation, in, in Jairus, his, uh, seeing his daughter being sick, and this woman with blood disease for 12 years, they both were at the end of the road. They both didn't know where to go. And I look at my own life, and I was like, okay, you know what? I've been there. I know what, how they felt. And they, they just reached out to Jesus. And he was there. <clears throat> John 6, verse 2, it says, And a great multitude followed him, because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were deceased, that were diseased. These massive crowds following Jesus wherever he went, and physically seeing him heal the sick, those that were dealing with any issue, Jesus could heal them. Seeing is believing. We see that nowadays. Well, I've got to see that to believe it. Seeing is believing. But we live, we live by faith. Right? So our faith is in Jesus. That He's covered our sins. We live by faith. So the whole, i got to see that to believe it. That mentality sometimes needs to go to the side. Because, you know what? That's not how Jesus operates. I can imagine myself being among the crowds and just seeing what's going on. Seeing people getting up. Thank you, Lord. You're... 
Jesus for healing. Put ourselves in those in Jairus and that, that woman with the blood disease, their shoes, just for a minute. And what drew them to Jesus was the fact that he had something that they needed. He added value to people's lives. It made them be put in a vulnerable position. Absolutely. To go to somebody and say, you know what? I need help. I'm struggling in this area. You got to be vulnerable. To go to Jesus and say, you know what? I'm struggling in this area. We still have to be vulnerable. This parable is mentioned three times in Scripture. Matthew chapter 9, Luke chapter 8, and in Mark chapter 5 here. It's mentioned three times. And I think the emphasis is that Jesus, His power that He has for each, and, each one of us um, is, is tremendous. The value that we have the value that we perceive we have. Remember my first question there? How do I see myself? My failures, my flaws, my personality, my attitude towards others. How I see myself and how God sees me are two different things. Each one of us can pick out the thorns in everybody else pretty quick. Yep, that's the thorn in him. He needs to shape up. How does... How does God view me in light of what Jesus Christ has done for me? Point, I have two points here this morning. Point number one is be open to pruning. You look at time of year, the example before us here this morning. These, Jairus and this woman with the blood disease, they push through the crowds. They want to get to Jesus. Why? Because He has something they need. In order to do that, they need to give up self. So in order for me, in my life, to conquer some of my thorns, I need to give up myself. Allow God to completely take control of my life. And don't let shame or any other tool of Satan dictate your walk with God. <clears throat> Verses 25 and 26 in this passage of Scripture, um, this woman had battled this disease for 12 years. She had spent all that she had. All the money she had, it was gone. She had nothing else to give. It does not say that she had any financial support from anyone else. It just says that she spent all her money. She had nothing left to lose. Nothing left. So what? what's... What's the use? I got nothing else, so I'm just... What? Let's try this. Or, okay, I see something different here in what this man is doing. I want that. She had no money, which... Did she have anything to eat? I, I don't know. Did her condition get better? Her condition actually got worse. Now look at my own life. How many times have I tried and tried and tried on my own without God's help and my condition got worse? The, the rose bush, the weeds crawled in, the aphids started to climb the stalk, and I lost sight of what my plan for God has for me. How many times has that happened in my life? Uh, so she had nothing left to lose. She was getting worse. <clears throat> she was worse off than when she started. Usually when we, when we spend our money, we want something of value in return. She had spent her money. She had nothing to show for it. She wanted healing. She went to the doctor. Everything she could. And she had nothing at all to show for it. We as humans, we work hard for our money. Normally, we want something to show for it. 
We want value there. So, again, putting myself in this woman's shoes, where would I turn? If I spend everything I've had, if I've given everything, nowhere to turn, where would I turn? Who would I confide in? Who alone could I trust? Jairus and this woman both found a new faith in Jesus to take control of their situations, based on their faith in Him from what they've seen Him do already. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 30 says, if I, meet, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. So, we talk about our struggles, do we? Do we confide in our brother, like Jonathan and David in Sunday school lesson? Or we, we always talk about the good things that are happening. We don't really talk about the normal things of life, the things that tear us apart. We talk about our struggles. I will share with others my weaknesses. I will make known that I'm not perfect. Imagine if we, had, if we had open and honest discussions about life struggles on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. I put myself in the shoes of the woman that touched Jesus' cloak and the times where it seems like it was 12 years long struggle for freedom. Sometimes we struggle for years and years and years and we want freedom and we got nothing. Why? Are we turning to the right person? The person that actually shows value in us. Loves us for who we are. Despite of our prickles, of our thorns. Scripture says in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all, that, all ye that are labor and, have, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus will take our burden no matter how big it is or how long we've carried it. Again, 12 years. Now, I've known people who have had infirmities, physical, ability, physical disabilities, whatever, their whole life. Not once have they open, openly complained. How many times I can be a complainer, I can look at my situations in life and, ah, well... I wish this was on somebody else. Or how many times do I find joy in where God has me? I would, I would like to know if Jairus and this woman with the blood disease, what their state of mind, what their, did they have joy in their circumstances? Because their circumstances definitely changed based on their approach to Jesus. We as humans, we tend to close up. Somebody says something to us, an area of discontent, an area of struggle. We are exactly like a rose. Most roses, the petals don't open up. Most roses stay closed. They're beautiful, perfect, amazing flowers. But most roses, the petals aren't opening up. We are exactly like a rose bush. We're exactly like roses. A lot of times, we want to stay closed. We don't want to be an open book. And that's okay sometimes. We want others to see our beauty, but we are never 100% confident and always self-conscious of what others say or think. We worry about what others say and think. I wonder when Jairus, again, he was one of the leaders in the synagogue, and this woman with the blood disease, I wonder what they thought others were thinking of them when they went to Jesus. Do you see that leader of the synagogue, what he was doing the other day? You see that woman that doesn't have any money, kind of ragged clothes, just... See what she was doing the other day?
No matter the heartache, no matter the trials, no matter the physical ailments and struggles, God is still here. God is our pruner. He is the one that takes away the things that hurt us, that tear us apart, that destroy relationships, that builds up walls between us and God. That was the relationship that Jesus wanted with Jairus and this woman. Am I willing to be examined? That's that question. Am I willing to be pruned? When we think of prune, we think of things being cut off. Well, that's never fun. I mean, I don't like cutting things off. I'm happy where I'm at. In order for us to flourish, in order for us to thrive, we need to allow God to come in and cut the dead things off. That our flower, our, the beauty that God sees us as, can grow, can flourish. John 15, 15 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into a fire, and they are burned. We need to get rid of that old stuff. Let the stuff go. The stuff that doesn't matter. Remember who we are and how God sees us. We dwell so much on the dead stuff. I dwell so much on the dead stuff sometimes. And not on how God views me. God views each of us in a different light. Perfect in his plan. Psalm 139, verse 23, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. So look at my plant. Look at my rose bush, so to speak. And get the wicked stuff out. Am I open and honest to God? Just get rid of it. I don't need it anymore. I want to flourish and I want to thrive and I want to show others the beauty that you've created in me. And I can't do that with this dead stuff here. Be willing to be pruned. <clears throat> Verse 31, it's kind of amazing. The disciples follow Jesus and they, they see his works and they question him though. Jesus had, had questioned them, and Jesus had, was leading them, and the disciples questioned him as to how he didn't know that people were touching. Um, it says, And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? But Jesus knew there was a divine encounter with him. One person that needed that encounter. My last point, point number two, is see yourself as God sees us. Jesus needed, this woman needed this divine encounter with, with Jesus. So did Jairus. <clears throat> so, verse 32, it says, And he looked around to see her, her that had done this thing. Well, I thought for just a minute. So when we see a rose... What do we see? We see its beauty. We see its beautiful rose petals, the many colors, the many roses. I got a mini rose from my dad years ago, six, seven years ago, and we planted it in a flower flower bed, and it's, it's thriving. Mini rose, tiny little rose, perfect. The teacup roses that are tiny, the, t the rose bushes that are tall and give large rose petals and vibrant colors, we don't focus on the prickles on the stem. We know they're there, and we handle them with care when we pick them up, knowing that if we are not careful, we could get hurt. After this woman had touched Jesus' garment, what did Jesus do? Verse 32. Jesus turns around. Aha! You're the one. You're the one that needed this encounter. You're the one 
I'm glad to meet you. I just imagine that Jesus slowly turning around. And this woman, this woman in fear, it does say she, she had fear and trembled, looks Jesus in the eye. And Jesus wanted that face-to-face -face encounter. So did the he wanted that personal connection. He wanted to see the look on her face of finally being set free. After the fear and trembling was gone, she was set free. Jesus looked at her imperfections as nothing. We look at our imperfections, our thorns, our thistles. It mean nothing. Her sickness has nothing he couldn't handle. I imagine Jesus turning around and holding out his hand to the woman and telling her, it's okay. Your battle's over. I got it. Verse 33. What did the woman do? And I put herself in her shoes again. What would we do? But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him the truth. And Jesus already knew this. He just wanted to hear it from her. He knew what was going on. What was Jesus' response to her? And I find this amazing. What did Jesus call her? He called her daughter. Verse 34. <clears throat> and he said unto her, Daughter, he added value in her vulnerability to go to Jesus. Jesus turns around and says, You know what? That's my daughter. I find value in her. I see her for who she is. Jairus, did he see him for who he is? Sure he did. But the fact that he turned around and, said, and called her daughter, it places value in her. Jesus viewed her as a precious rose. Jesus saw the beauty in her, the value in her, because of her faith. I imagine in the moment it was just Jesus and the woman. You think of the throngs of people that are around them. The distractions, the noise. And you ever have an encounter with somebody where it's just you and that person and everybody else just, pff, they're gone. I imagine that as Jesus and this woman. It's just, they have that encounter. Perfect. Everything else kind of not even, not even bothering them. This was the encounter that this woman longed for, to have value, to not be remembered for being sick. Nothing else mattered. She finally had met the only man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that could take anything away. <clears throat> if you step back just a few verses in 28, her faith in Jesus had made her whole. Jesus knew what was about to happen, but he wanted that encounter. It, it started with Jairus. It started with one man being vulnerable, going to Jesus. His daughter was eventually healed. <clears throat> and in the middle, there's this woman that needed that encounter, that needed value. That's how it is in our lives as well. It's, it has to start somewhere. It might start with somebody else, a relative, family member, whatever. But eventually, it comes back to us to see the value in ourselves. The world easily sees our imperfections, our flaws, our sins. God sees us as His children, perfect in Him only. Our value in Him knows no bounds. Our value in Him, not our value in ourselves, our value in Him. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given, us, given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their treasures unto them, and hath committed us 
unto us the word of reconciliation. Now when we are ambassadors for Christ, as through God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We are made perfect in Jesus Christ. So my, my question this morning is, what do you see yourself as? Where's your value? What, what, what value do you see yourself as? Do you see yourself as the rose or from the, from the petals down? Matthew 10, verse 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more value, you are more of more value than many sparrows. The value that each one of us have are more than anything that we can ever imagine. Because we are sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying we be complacent and we live in sin. We, we be content with the thorns. We be content with whatever else that are, are choking off some of our things. But to be steadfast and continually wanting to get rid of those things. Somebody has the tool to take the thorns off. And you're left with a perfect rose. So what do you see yourself this morning? Are you being fed spiritually? Do you have the perfect petals? We all like to be perfect. Strive for perfection. Are we full of thorns? Which, we're human. We're going to have struggles in life. I've never met a perfect Christian in my life. I've met people who thought they were perfect. We strive to be perfect each and every day. How do we see ourselves? Because how we see ourselves and how God sees us are two different, two different ways. Place value on yourself. We need to start viewing ourselves like a rose. Christ living in us gives us the joy or the beauty that the world sees. The vibrant colors, the short and tall roses, those that have small rose petals and those that have large ones. We need to allow God, though, to prune us, to pull the weeds out and to help us grow. Without God, we are like a rose bush that does not get the weeds pulled out. We try and try to flourish, but, get, but everything gets choked off by the world, and we become useless. God is our insecticide. He gets rid of the bugs. He gets rid of everything that, that kills the, the vine. <clears throat> Our flower or our light does not shine. If, if, it is, if it is your heart's desire this morning to remember how God views you at the end of the service, I'll have these in the back, take a rose, let it dry, and put it in a spot where you can look at it and remember how God truly sees you. Because God loves us despite all of our prickles and our thorns. He takes... He took our prickles on the cross with the thorn of crowns he wore. Imagine the, the thorns when you're pulling a weeding, pulling a rose bush or something, and how they hurt. Imagine that on your head. Being pushed down. God has value in us, each, each and every one of us. We have traits that we don't like. We have traits that... We don't like in others. Start to see yourself in a new light, how God views you. Rely on Him to take everything else away. It will work each and every time. Let's pray.